Hi everyone, it's Guillaume from Startup Basecamp. Welcome to the Tech for Climate podcast. During the show, you will have the opportunity to meet the best climate tech founders, investors, and experts from both Silicon Valley and around the globe. They will share with you their stories and personal journeys into this growing and exciting industry, giving you some insight into the ecosystems that help you to take part in the fight against climate change and benefit from the opportunities it can represent. Podcast is divided in two small interviews. During the first part, you will get to know our speakers, their perspectives on the climate crisis and how climate tech is changing the game. The second part of the discussion will be for members of our community who will learn the speaker's secret sauce on how to and share with you their unique expertise on topics such as fundraising, management, strategy and so on to help you to become a better leader in your field. So before we start, I would like to quickly share what we are doing at Startup Basecamp to support climate tech founders in accessing resources and gaining visibility with investors they seek. Our initiatives include a membership-based community platform offering access to a dedicated Slack group with a growing number of founders, experts and investors from around the world and a series of exclusive content such as interviews, weekly job listings, events, and our quarterly online pitch of night opportunity. But more than a place where you can learn, exchange, and grow, we are building a matchmaking service to facilitate connections between our members and top investors and experts in the field. And soon, alongside with other top investors, we will be launching a small fund to co-invest in the growth and acceleration of our members. Finally, all of this is possible because of your support and donations. We are a small self-funded team and we want you to be part of this collective movement against climate change. So please share one episode with a friend and subscribe to the channels. As an added bonus, we will plant a tree for each of our subscribers each time we reach 1,000 new fans or donors. Do not hesitate to connect with me via social media or email guillaume at Startup Basecamp. Thanks a lot for listening. I hope to get in touch with you soon. And now, let's go for the show. Hi, everyone. During this new episode of our founder series, we're sitting down with Josh Santos, co-founder and CEO at Noia, which has developed an exciting and affordable CO2 capture process that utilizes existing industrial equipment such as boring cooling towers to pull CO2 out of the air. Noya then takes the CO2 pulled from the atmosphere and repackages it for sale to industrial CO2 consumers. I was super excited to speak with Josh and learn more about his story, which started at Tesla and then Harley Davidson and led to the launch of Noya. We will discover with Josh the direct air capture tech landscape today, what's happening in the industry, and then go deeper into their unique an affordable process which opens the road to scale DAC technology. One of the key technology, I believe, in the fight against climate change. Finally, Josh will share the next steps necessary to achieve their growth and how you can get involved into the process today. In the second part of the talk, Josh will give a secret sauce for early stage founders looking to fundraise with famous investors as Low Carbon Capital or MCG Collective. Finally, he will share some key advice on how to join YC and his own work-life balance tips for founders. Josh, welcome to the show. Hi, Josh. Welcome to the Tech for Climate podcast. We're super excited to uh, have you here with us today. So before we start, can you give us a 30-second intro about Noya? Yeah, I'd love to. And thanks for having me on the podcast this morning, Guy. I'm really excited to be here and, and excited about the work that you're doing for all of us in climate. So thanks for having me. Noya is fundamentally reducing the capital cost and time required for building, installing, and commissioning direct air capture machines. We're doing this by retrofitting existing pieces of industrial equipment by cooling towers and turning them into CO2 capture machines. Um, we, we saw when we started the company that, um, that these processes can take a huge amount of time, sometimes years, to build. And they cost a lot of money to actually install in the hundreds of millions of dollars, sometimes above a billion dollars to build. And so Noya is solving that problem and making direct air capture a scalable and quickly deployable solution for the uh, continued uh, addressment of climate change. 
Okay, so let's start by the top. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about uh, your story, uh, Josh, and, and your background? Anything maybe specific that uh, is not public yet about uh, what you what you like to do uh, besides uh, building Noya? Uh, and I would like to use this uh, this story as well as a segue to kind of like explain us a little bit like what were your driver uh, that really like was the uh, motivation for you to jump into the clean climate tech uh, industry. Yeah, I think that the driver goes back to, you know, when I was little, I grew up across the United States Southeast. Um, I lived in almost every state between Georgia and Texas, north to Kentucky, and went to 13 different schools before shipping up to Boston for college. And, um, and, and having the opportunity to have traveled across most of the Southeast, I saw um, you know, I saw that uh, we Southerners love our fried foods. I also saw that there's, there's a, a, a huge way in which climate change presents itself and has been presenting itself for years in the form of hurricanes down there. I had to live through many experiences where I remember we had to take shelter from some sort of dangerous storm or winds or tornadoes that were caused by these, uh, these, these tropical storms. And, um, and they've only been getting worse since I was little. <clears throat> and so I, you know, I, I just want to be able to, I think, help, um, help, help people like me, kids like I was in the future to not have these, uh, to not have these, these, you know, terrible experiences where they have to witness destruction and huddle in a closet with their family for safety and shelter. So that's a really fundamental part of what, um, what, what drove me to want to want to start Noya and, and when I got to college, I studied chemical engineering because I, I wanted to um, I wanted to, you know, give back to this problem somehow. And uh, I was you know, fortunate to have some great, great teachers and professors at MIT where I went to college at. And then moving out to to San Francisco, I, um, I spent some time at a YC back startup doing more health tech stuff. But then transitioned right into climate. And I worked at Tesla and Harley Davidson in both cases doing EV program management. And so I think climate's been a, a continuous strain of, of, of impact and desire over my entire career so far. And Noya is just the next step in that evolution and the next step in me trying to trying to fulfill this you know, personal mission of mine of uh, not having kids hide in closets anymore from big, scary storms. Okay. So... The, I was super excited to have you on the on the show, and, and especially because direct of capture uh, for a lot of us. I mean, we, we keep hearing about like it could be like the, the magic in a way tools to help us to to decrease uh, all of the, I mean this humongous amount of of CO two uh, that is already uh, in the air. But can you give us a little bit the the overview uh, of the direct air capture uh, technology landscape today. I mean, how is it evolving and what is blocking and slowing it down? Uh, and maybe, you know, what needs to happen to operate that technology at scale and really like having uh, direct air capture contributing to effectively reach the 2050 net zero goal? Yeah. Director capture is an important solution in the in the future of how we're going to address this this challenge that we're facing. And I do know that a lot of people think of it as a silver bullet. I think um, I think a better way to think about it or a different framing might be that it should only be needed once we've done everything else to reduce uh, all of our emissions down to to zero or as close to zero as we can get. Uh, the less we emit the less we have to pull out of the atmosphere. It's a pretty, it's a pretty straightforward math equation. Um, the landscape's rapidly evolving. It's a really exciting time to be a director capture company. Uh, <clears throat> we've seen in the past you know, year and a half since we started working on Noya, um, you know, many different kinds of companies with many different kinds of solutions entering the space. Um, in terms of the landscape and, and how you can kind of segment direct air capture, I think there are a few different ways and, and people, people have written, uh, you know, very complete uh, reports that are much more comprehensive than what I'll say here, but I'll sort of bucket them in into two different categories. There are, uh, there are, um, and, and I'm referring to technologies for pulling CO2 from the atmosphere. Direct air capture on land is one, direct ocean capture in the ocean is another. Um, on land, people are using all kinds of ways. Some people use uh, 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 liquid chemical mixture that they push air past that captures CO2. Some people are designing um, 
a, a solid material that is able to react with CO2 in the air and using that to capture CO2 from the stream. Some people are taking electric, uh, electrochemical uh, approaches, some people are taking biological approaches, some people are taking enzymatic approaches. And so there are, there are many different theories and approaches and ways in which um, people are taking, uh, taking that, um, t- taking a stab at solving this huge problem. I think what makes Noya really unique is that we have flexibility to, to kind of go across a few. So our first process was, uh, and, and what we built um, a few months ago in the East Bay with our first commercial partner, that's running a process that uses a liquid, uh, a liquid solution of chemicals that's reacted with CO2 to capture CO2 from the air. We're now developing a second version of our process that will use more of a solid material approach. And all of these are gonna be able to install on the 2 million cooling towers we have in the US. And so we can, we can iterate and learn and, and change and design much uh, uh, incredibly quickly, and that's one of our key differentiating factors. In terms of what is holding direct air capture up as a as a as a market, if you will, um, it's that it is kind of a waste management problem at this point, right? And there's CO two is a waste as, as least as far as we have used it uh, in the past, or as far as we thought about it in the past, and so um, and so there are there isn't really a set a set of rules on how we should how we should manage that waste. Um, there are tons of companies, and, and we're one of those that are trying to take CO2 and pull value from it, so it becomes less of a waste and more of a feedstock, and therefore it can tap into existing markets or markets that are developing now. Um, but in terms of just carbon removal in general and what will unlock its true scale, I think that it's going to require some some sort of solution to that waste management problem. In the short term, we're able to get some traction, early growth, and begin to build out the business and the technology using existing markets. Our specific approach is, has us selling CO2 to people that already use CO2. And um, we'll always prefer people that lock it up forever, folks like uh, folks that are putting CO2 into concrete. Um, we love that because they're, they're locking up forever and we don't have to worry about it. Um, and as, as the rest of the landscape develops on the, on the demand side in terms of people paying for carbon removal or people paying for captured CO2, then we'll be developed and ready to tap into that market when red when uh, when it becomes available. Mm-hmm. So, before we go to uh, to, to deep into uh, into Noya, I'd like to understand a little bit like the the, the story uh, of, of Noya. So, you and your, your co-founder, like I mean, and your original team, like how long did you know it take you guys to put together the, the first prototype, and what was the the initial challenges that uh, that you faced, and how did you overcome them? I got a little lucky because my co-founder was my roommate for like five years in San Francisco. <clears throat> we lived together in the Mission District, and I think we were both feeling the desire to do something more impactful and more important and, and, and better for the world. <clears throat> um, his background's in mechanical engineering. He does he has done a lot of robotics work and a ton of work on like huge industrial moonshot type projects. And so his his expertise fits really nicely with exactly the stuff we need. And I just remember, um, you know, as I was thinking about like, what, what are the big problems that I specifically am able to impact given my unique set of skills and, and, and what I want to do in the world. I just sort of asked myself the question, like if, if climate change is caused by there being too much CO2 in the sky, then can't we just pull CO2 out of the sky. Now that's an incredibly naive question for everybody in climate because <laughs> everybody already knows the answer to that is yes. Uh, I, I hadn't looked much into climate at that point. I was focused on EVs. And so uh, much into, I should say not climate, much into carbon removal and, and, um, and that whole entire budding space. And so I said, okay, well, this is a fairly straightforward question. Let's just try to find an answer to it. And so I talked to Daniel, my co-founder, about this, and, um, and, and we started iterating on a couple of different ideas, uh, pivoted once from an idea that was bad to what the idea that we have now. And, um, and we, you know, in terms of like getting the first prototype done, we were able to hack it together pretty quickly in my backyard. We did it in like, I don't know, a month maybe. Um, and then using that prototype, we were able to close our first round of funding from 50 years and lower carbon capital. Um, <clears throat> we then got into Y Combinator and then started building our second large prototype, uh, or I should say commercial pilot. And that's what's currently running in the East Bay and actively pulling CO2 from the sky. And that took us about four months to build. 
Um, so we had a lot of challenges at the beginning because we didn't have any money to spend on any of this. We were trying to bootstrap <laughs> a hard tech startup. <laughs> um, so that wasn't great, but, uh, but we were able to be really scrappy. And I remember my Daniel, he, he like bought a barrel off of Craigslist for $20. And then we like sawed some hose into the side of it and, and built a really janky cooling tower in the backyard, but it worked. And it allows us, allowed us to at least prove the concept that, that with our solution, you can capture CO2 from the air. I'm sure, I'm sure the, the, the surrounding area uh, was super excited to, to see two guys like starting to, uh, to do like those, uh, those uh, strange experiments in the, in the backyard. <laughs> My, uh, my, my neighbor was um, less than psyched. <laughs> At some point, I remember he, he stuck his head out the window to ask us what we were doing. And we told him we were working on a side project and, and that it was all going to be fine. And then a few hours later, uh, our, door, our doorbell rings and I go to answer it. And, um, and waiting for me on the other side of the doorbell are 15 of San Francisco's finest police officers from the bomb squad with, uh, with the fire chief and a robot for bombs because my neighbor thought we were building bombs in the backyard. <laughs> and so he called this entire squad of people to come and check out exactly what we're doing. I have a picture of, <laughs> they let us take of, of their oh visit. Um, but uh, they, they were called a few more times to the house after that, despite the fact that we told our neighbor we weren't building a bomb. We told them we weren't building a bomb. We, <laughs> we were trying to help guys. Uh, Yeah, so they weren't psyched about that, <laughs> but uh, luckily for everybody, we were able to find an office and uh, and move our not a bomb out of it into that space. <laughs> That's an incredible story, man. Thanks you for for sharing that. Um, so it, let's go a bit back to 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 your prototype and 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 know what you uh, what you have in pilot project. Like, how how does it work? Uh, if you can walk us through a bit more uh, into the, the the tech in itself, like. Um, You know, and, and you mentioned that uh, you're working with uh, with cooling towers. Uh, was that a choice per, per se, or was it easier for that? Or how, how did you come choosing a cooling tower at first uh, instead of something else? When we started working on what was to become Noya at the time, it was just half of an idea and and <laughs> and, uh, and and a lot of excitement. We had identified that. You know, one of the hardest parts about direct air capture was the fact that it requires a lot of equipment. It's all pretty expensive. Mm -hmm. and, and so we said, you know, from the start that if we can find a way to think differently and creatively about the capital costs of direct air capture, we can probably build a solution that's going to be unique. So I mentioned, I mentioned our first prototype idea earlier. Um, that idea was uh, an air purifier that pulls CO2 out of the sky. And that would be something that consumers would buy. And so consumers would take on the CapEx themselves and, you know, they would pay for the OpEx and we'd pay them for running the thing. And it'd be this beautiful cycle. I still like that idea, like emotionally. I don't like it as much from a business perspective because of reasons I, I will spare you and your listeners. But, um, but, but through, the, through the work on that, we realized that You know, our, our, our air purifier, it was, we were designing it initially to work on some liquid based solution that moved air past water and was able to capture CO2 in that way. And so when we scrapped that idea and started working on something else, we didn't know what else, but we knew that it had to have those two things available. And so we were like racking our brains trying to figure out where in the hell we could find this source of air and water. Um, it was late one Friday night, my da Daniel got a call and, and uh, it was his dad. And his dad's an engineer. He owns a refrigeration plant. And Daniel's dad um, was telling Daniel about uh, about started telling Daniel about the problems that that he was having with his cooling tower, which he uses for powering his plant. And Daniel had never really heard of a cooling tower, and so he asked more questions about it and said, "What what is this thing? How does it work? Tell me about it." And his dad was like, "Why do you care so much about this cooling tower?" Um, and then he came. He like stormed back into the room really excitedly. He was like, "Josh, Josh, we should use cooling towers." Uh, And I said, "What the hell is a cooling tower?" <laughs> and and maybe, um, maybe and you can you can explain uh, in in few words what's uh, a cooling tower because uh, uh, probably many of the listeners are not uh, as well as uh, qualified as you are. <laughs> yeah, well, I wasn't qualified either in cooling towers when we started. <laughs> uh, a cooling tower you can think of as basically um, it's a big box inside of which you have a fan on top that pulls air inside of the box and some fancy showers inside that drop water down. 
So inside of this box, this fan's pulling air up and the showers are dropping water down. The air and water are coming into direct contact with each other and they're used for the purposes of industrial cooling. They're really good at doing what they do and we built a lot of them. There are 2 million cooling towers in the US alone that are, um, that are, that are powering industrial processes. And so we found that, you know, based on our estimates, we can pull somewhere like 10 billion tons of CO2 from the sky using just these cooling towers alone. And, um, and so we did all that math and, and started figuring this out. And we were like, holy cow, this is crazy. We should definitely do this. Um, but then we had to like figure out how the heck we built a cooling tower with no money and, 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 um, and, and no idea really what a cooling tower was. So we, <laughs> so that's kind of what led us to that, to the bomb story and, and ultimately to, to where we're at now. Fantastic. And, and do you believe that your, your actual like, uh, you know, process um, is applicable to different, uh, different things and to only cooling towers or it's really focused right on cooling tower only? Or do you see there's any, yeah. I mean, different potential application like the exhaust uh, fumes or maybe like a factory or something like that? Uh, I don't know. I'm just uh, iterating here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, I, I definitely think there are many different types of applications that we can use for our technology. Um, we, you know, we're, we're, what we found about our tech is that we, cooling towers are a fantastic source of uh, humid air and humid air is exactly what's needed to activate the carbon capture materials that we're using. And so if we can just find other sources of humid air that are already moving, then we can likely expand this technology to beyond cooling towers, right? If we can find moving streams of air that are just kind of going into the atmosphere, well, those have energy and those are pushing CO2. And we ought to use every single piece of infrastructure we can that we've built over the past hundred years to get ourselves out of this problem in the next 30 years. And so I think there are endless amounts of applications beyond cooling towers and we're just at the very beginning of where our technology is going to be applicable to. And I'm incredibly excited to, to have the opportunity to build what's going to be next for us. Fantastic. So j just to, and that would be my, my last question on the product in itself, but um, what needs to happen for cooling tower to be retrofit uh, and uh, in a way works with your, with your process? How long does it take? Uh, how much does it cost, if any? And, 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 and what's the, the, I mean, how, how fast can you scale the, that, that, that process in itself? We estimate that when we're, when we're um, you know, when we're at, uh, uh, at ramp and ready to scale our process, it's going to cost us around somewhere between five hundred, seven hundred fifty thousand dollars to uh to, to build one of these and it's probably going to take us somewhere around three to four months to build one that money and installation time will get us something like and again it depends on the cooling tower because they they it, they vary in size but um, it'll get us something like three thousand tons a year maybe mm -hmm. per uh, of co2 from the atmosphere per cooling tower um, for us to to install our process we just need to install a few pieces of equipment that we're designing right now next to the cooling tower that don't really change anything about the cooling tower they sort of just like lego plug in to it and um and and what we're doing there is basically just taking advantage like i said of the airflow running it through the equipment that we're using for capturing processing regenerating and pressurizing the co2 that we capture and then we move it off-site where we where we where we sell it to customers that need it. Okay, so tell me a bit more about like the, the CO2 that uh, that you that you capture. Um, what are the application? Uh, who is using that uh, that that CO2? Are you guys selling it? Uh, and I guess uh, those buyers like how do you bring that CO2 to 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 the buyers in itself? Like how do you what's the logistics involved to uh, to really like. Uh, you know, transfer the CO2 from the cooling tower to the, uh, to the, the, the potential buyer? <clears throat> Globally, there are just under 250 million tons of CO2 consumed in the world today. <clears throat> Much of that goes towards um, things that you think about when you think about what direct air capture has traditionally be used, been used for, things like enhanced oil recovery, um, 
as a, as a great example. Um, it's used in chemicals and it's used in food, medical applications. I mean, CO2 has many different applications, <clears throat> which people use it for. And there are largely speaking, generally speaking, two kind of uh, ways in which CO2 is distributed. The first is in a liquefied form where you're, you have a company that's consuming it in, in high amounts. And the second is in cylinders where you have companies that are, um, that are consuming it in smaller amounts. Many of the companies that are consuming it in smaller amounts in these cylinders are small businesses, right? They're, they're, they're business owners that are trying to grow their business and they've had a rough time over the past year, year and a half. And um, many of them are grossly overpaying for the amount of CO2 uh, grossly overpaying for the CO2 that, we're, that they're buying. And they're doing that because they're not buying it in high amounts. So the, the, the like individual cost of a cylinder to them is not really that much. But when you add up all of the cylinders that are required to make, say, a ton of CO2, the production cost is immense. And so what we're really doing is we're serving these businesses first, these small businesses and food and beverage and companies like, uh, you know, like, 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 your local bar or your local restaurants or your local uh, favorite craft breweries or any of these sorts of folks that use CO2, um, but are probably grossly overpaying for it. We're helping to serve with our, with, fr from the very beginning. And so that's our first uh, target customer because, <clears throat> um, because we, we can, we can help make them uh, help make their businesses better. And, and it's great for us because when our costs are still high, because we're still working on the optimization and development of our process, it allows us to take that, take that money and plow it straight into R&D. Um, in terms of the logistics, CO2 typically has a pretty inefficient supply chain as to come from where it's made, which is generally an ethanol plant, at least in the US. Uh, CO2 is produced as an ethanol byproduct. When, and those are, you know, who knows where, right? Somewhere um, in, in uh, very far away from urban areas where we tend to find a high concentration of these small businesses I was talking about. And then they have to go through a few steps, whether it's, you know, um, uh, ethanol facility to secondary holding facility to local distribution center to, uh, to, to, to small business before they actually get to where they need to go. We're also fundamentally solving that, right? We're making an incredibly much, uh, an incredibly uh, simplified process by developing a carbon capture technology that can be installed on the rooftops of commercial real estate buildings in dense urban environments, then we can turn every single skyscraper in San Francisco, New York City, Chicago, et cetera, into its own individual CO2 vacuum that's just sucking CO2 out of the sky. Some of that CO2 is going to go to these small businesses. Some of it's going to go to larger businesses in the future when we have our costs lower. And the rest of it's going to be removed from the atmosphere. And as this market that I talked about earlier, this carbon removal market continues to mature, more and more of our CO2 is going to go towards that, right? We exist to accelerate the, the transition of, of the world to a, to a carbon neutral existence we ought to be removing as much CO2 as possible as that market starts to develop. And that's exactly what we're gonna do. So we're starting with the, with the folks that, um, that I'm really excited to serve and, and we're moving to um, everybody else that I'm also really excited to serve by removing the CO2 from the sky. So maybe let's, let's go a little bit into the, uh, the economics of, uh, of, of Noia. What are the current one and the expected, uh, expected one? I mean, you mentioned like uh, also, I think your, your business model is uh, quite innovating. Um, tell us a bit more about like, you know, margin and how, how, you already mentioned the, the cost to put, uh, to put a, I mean, your, insta your installation into a, a existing cooling uh, tower. Uh, but what are the economics behind that uh, as an investor? Why uh, you think that you can in a way beat the market? Yeah, our <clears throat> first process, the one that we have running already, uh, we, we estimated that we can get that process down to around um, $150 per, per ton, probably closer to $100 uh, per ton. And and we can do that because we're able to take advantage of what many different facilities and plants have available to them, which is just a lot of waste heat. Um, so by using that waste heat, we can keep our costs low and, um, and, and, you know, be able to provide CO2 at a cheap, cheap price. Um, with our new version of our process, our costs are going to be 
even better than what I just mentioned. We're not publicly sharing any of the information about that process yet, but um, I am incredibly excited about what it's going to offer to us and, and the industry. Um, <clears throat> in terms of uh, you know gross margin and, and kind of how we're thinking about the numbers, we're we're able to be um, cost competitive or better than what current CO2 providers can be. And, and we can do that because, like I said, we're making the supply chain more efficient. We're uh, keeping the CapEx low. In many cases, we're able to keep our, uh, our own OpEx low. And so our costs are minimal in terms of <laughs> relative to a direct air capture process and what people typically think about and, uh, and, and can many times beat the incumbent CO2 providers as we're, um, as, as we're starting to grow our space in the market. So in terms of like um, business model in itself, uh, you mentioned that there's a, a share of new, uh, you know, model in place with uh, uh, the owner of the uh, cooling tower. Uh, or how does it work? Is am I right by saying that? So yeah, our, our business model is um, it's incredibly viral for the cooling tower owners. We cover the upfront capital costs of what it will take to install this process at a given facility. We take the CO2 that is produced by this process and we sell it into the market and we give the cooling tower owners a small percentage of the revenue that's generated from the sale of the CO2. So they don't really have to pay anything. And in exchange, they get two things. They get the ability to market the fact that they have a, a carbon vacuum on their rooftop and they get the ability to get paid because of it. So um, so it's a sweet business model for them. <laughs> and for us, we like it because it, uh, it, it, you know, does a lot of the obvious benefits, right? It reduces friction, gets you, blah, 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 right? All those things. Um, but I, I like it most because it, it puts a lot of the pressure on us to, to then like, we own the job of making the process more efficient and, and cheaper and easier and simpler. Like we own that because we are directly incentivized to do that. So I, I think it, it aligns incentives across us and the businesses we're partnering with really nicely. And that's what everybody that we've, um, we've, we've got on board so far has said. We've got over a hundred locations across 10 US cities that are on our wait list. And, um, and we're, we're super excited to, uh, to, to continue to grow that as well. Fantastic. So can you tell us a bit more about the, uh, the, the, the competition do you have any direct competition today in terms of uh, i mean compared to you know using existing uh, facilities to capture uh, co2 or it's like you guys are the only one in the in, in the market right now yeah we you know we're really trying to to charter this um this new distributed direct air capture space where you instead of you know, building huge plants, build many small plants. And within that space, um, we are the only ones that I know of that are doing, um, that are doing retrofits of existing industrial equipment. Okay. Um, in, in terms of um, market opportunity, um, you guys are focusing in the, in the US uh, right now. Um, are you then planning or would it be possible for you guys to expand uh, internationally, maybe Europe or South America, or um, is that something that, uh, that you have in the, in the pipeline? And what would be the step in a way to, 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 to achieve this uh, more like a global expansion? What needs yeah. to happen? Yeah, CO2 is a global problem, so it's going to require a global solution. And that's exactly how we're thinking about it. We've been talking to different partners across many different geographies about how we might be able to work with them to enter you know, a specific given market. And we're still working on our expansion plans and trying to figure out you know, what year are we gonna go to where, or where it's gonna be first and all of these things. We do know that cooling towers are everywhere. And so our process is applicable everywhere and we intend to make it that way. Fantastic. Um... Now, I'd like to ask you a little bit about like, what are the, the, the challenges uh, that uh, the, the company is facing today in terms of like uh, reaching that, that new uh, uh, level of funding, level of like expansion? What is now like the, the few things that keeps you uh, up at night and uh, things like, ah, when that is done, we can move on to the, to the next step? Generally speaking, companies like ours, you can call them hard tech, climate tech, hard climate tech. I've heard all of them. Um, 
we have a couple of different sets of milestones that need to be reached, right? One is uh, because we're doing something technologically novel, we have to typically prove some advancement of our technology to some degree. And we have to prove the commercial advancement as well. So we have to do those two things. And those are exactly the things that are going to unlock our next round of funding. And that's everything that, that uh, our team here at Noya is working really hard on. Um, and, you know, for, for me specifically, what, uh, you know, what keeps me up is the advancement of those two things. So uh, we're working on something that's really hard and we're trying to do it fast and we're trying to do it in a way that's going to, it's going to work incredibly well. And uh, that's just a lot of work to do. Our team's been making great strides and I'm incredibly grateful to have the opportunity to work with such passionate, intelligent individuals. And, um, and so I'm not as worried about that one and the commercial one, I'm not really worried about because people have been loving the process. So it's just work that we're doing um, and work that we need to keep doing in order for us to unlock the round of funding that's going to be ahead of us. Fantastic. And um, in terms of like carbon credit, is that something that you guys are also uh, considering in terms of, uh, you know, an extra revenue stream uh, to put in the, into the pipeline? Yeah, I anticipate that we will start at uh, we will start doing carbon removal credits and, and begin selling those. Um, and I think it goes back to what I was saying earlier about, you know, it requires the market to be there at prices that are enough to warrant that body of work. So mm -hmm. we will, you know, we'll keep a close eye on it and we'll continue building our plans for how we'll enter that space. And when the time is right, we'll, we'll do that. So how is the, the community of listeners uh, can, you know, help you today? Uh, what, uh, what they can do to, to help uh, Noya go to the, to the next step? If any of this has sounded interesting, uh, we're hiring. We're hiring across a few technical roles right now. Um, mechanical engineering, materials engineering, uh, chemical engineering, um, and, uh, and, and I'm happy to, to talk to anybody about uh, what we're doing and, and learn about your individual career goals. You can email me at josh at noyalabs.com and I'd love to, love to talk to you. Uh, if you are a commercial real estate owner in the US that wants to be an early pilot site for this process, I'd love to talk to you. Um, you can make some extra money and you can uh, decarbonize your building because of it. Uh, you can email me again at josh at norialabs.com. Would love to talk with you. Uh, and if you need CO2 in the San Francisco Bay Area or in any urban area and uh, you, you think you can, um, you can market uh, the, atmosphere, the, the, the cleanest source of CO2 that's available to us today, which we have, um, then I'd love to talk to you as well. So I think those are the three ways that uh, would be helpful. Any uh, question that I did not ask you that uh, I should have maybe for this part of the interview? Um, I, I don't. Uh, I don't. I don't think so. This has been. This has been. This has been awesome. Thanks for having me here again, and uh, appreciate appreciate the time. And uh, and it's been great. Thank you so much, uh, Josh. Uh, congratulations on everything that you guys are doing with uh, Noya. Uh, it's super, super exciting to see that uh, those, uh, those new solutions are, are coming to, to market and, uh, and are ready to, uh, to, to scale. Uh, we're, super, uh, you know, we're super happy to, to have you here with us uh, and we'll definitely uh, follow up with you guys in a uh, in few months uh, and uh, in any way we can support you, uh, we'll be there as well.